It's Friday, March 15th. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis can prosecute Donald Trump on charges that he interfered with Georgia's 2020 presidential election. Now that a special prosecutor with whom she had a romantic relationship has withdrawn from the case. Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McCarthy ruled earlier today that Willis could stay if special prosecutor Nathan Wade left. President Joe Biden today praises a speech by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer in which the New York Democrat called for Israel to hold elections to replace Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu five months into Israel's war with Hamas. At the United Nations in New York, the United States is finalizing a new ceasefire resolution for the Security Council. The United States and its allies warn Iran that major Western economies will pile new sanctions on Tehran if it moves forward with an emerging plan to provide ballistic missiles to Russia for its war with Ukraine. Spain's parliament approves a controversial amnesty bill for Catalan separatists charged with crimes for holding an independence referendum six years ago. It's part of a deal forming a left-leaning socialist ruling coalition for Spain. And a federal judge today appoints a special master to oversee the troubled women's federal prison in Dublin, known for rampant sexual abuse against inmates, marking the first time the Federal Bureau of Prisons has been subject to such oversight. From Pacifica Radio in the studios of KBFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. A special prosecutor who had a romantic relationship with Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis formally withdrew today from the Georgia election interference case against Donald Trump after a judge ruled he had to leave or Willis could not continue to pursue the charges. Attorney Nathan Wade's resignation allows Willis to remain on the most sprawling of four criminal cases against the presumptive Republican nominee for the 2024 presidential nomination of the Republican Party. But the long-term damage to the public perception of the prosecution remains unclear, particularly in light of Trump's relentless barrage of attacks on the pair, who pledged to hold Trump accountable but found their own actions under a public microscope. Wade offered his resignation in a letter to Willis, saying he was doing so in the interests of democracy, in dedication to the American public, and to move this case forward as quickly as possible. Willis complimented Wade's professionalism and dignity in a letter accepting his resignation, effective immediately. She said he had endured threats against himself and his family, as well as unjustified attacks in the media and in court on his reputation as a lawyer. Meanwhile, in a social media post, Trump said the Danny Willis lover had resigned in disgrace, and Trump repeated his assertion that the case is an effort to hurt his campaign to reclaim the White House in November. Trump, of course, has denied doing anything wrong and pled not guilty. Ed Donahue reports. A judge's ruling results in changes in the prosecution of former President Donald Trump in the Georgia election interference case. Judge Scott McAfee ruled District Attorney Fonnie Willis can step aside or Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade must be removed. Willis and Wade had a romantic relationship. Wade later offered his resignation, saying he was doing so in the interest of democracy and to quickly move the case forward. Willis talked about the relationship during a hearing last month. We would have brutal arguments about the fact that I am your equal. I don't need anything from a man. A man is not a plan. McAfee did not find the relationship was a conflict of interest, but said the allegations created an appearance of impropriety that infected the prosecution team. Donald Trump's team wanted Fonnie Willis and her team kicked off the case. I'm Ed Donahue. 
In New York, a judge ruled today that former President Donald Trump's hush money trial in Manhattan, slated to start later this month, got at least a short reprieve but won't begin before mid-April. The postponement was allowed after Trump's legal team requested more time to review more than 100,000 pages of new evidence from the Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office. Judge Juan Mershon's decision came shortly before Trump's trial on 24 felony counts. The hushed money case centers on whether Trump illegally falsified records to cover up reimbursing his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, for a $130,000 payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels just ahead of the 2016 presidential election. Daniels has claimed she had a sexual encounter with Trump before his presidency, a claim he denies. The White House today called for an end to the six-month-old impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden and his family citing Republican investigators' failure to turn up any evidence of wrongdoing on the part of the president. In a scathing letter to House Speaker Mike Johnson, White House counsel Ed Siskel said it had become clear that the House Republican impeachment is over, citing reporting by ABC News, Punchbowl News, and Fox News, in which members of the Republican majority admitted to reporters that the inquiry is falling apart, has found nothing anywhere close to an impeachable offense, and has failed to identify a particular crime that they can use to justify impeaching Biden. The letter also cited the imminent departure of Colorado Republican Ken Buck, who said in his decision to resign from the House effective next week, stems in part from his colleague's decision to take impeachment and make it a social media issue as opposed to a constitutional concept. Sagar Magani reports from the White House. The White House's top lawyer is encouraging House Republicans to end their effort to impeach President Biden. In a rare letter to House Speaker Mike Johnson, White House counsel Ed Siskel says it's obviously time to move on. He notes GOP-led panels have found no evidence the president benefited from family business dealings and Republicans should stop wasting time on a charade. The impeachment inquiry is at a near standstill, and while Johnson acknowledges it's unclear if the probe will find any impeachable offenses, the investigation continues. It needs to be very careful and deliberate. And says it has uncovered things the GOP believes broke the law without giving evidence or details. Sagar Magani, Washington. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously today that public officials can be sued sometimes for blocking their critics on social media. It's an issue that first arose for the high court in a case involving then-President Donald Trump. Justice Amy Coney Barrett wrote for the court today, saying officials who use personal accounts to make official statements may not be free to delete comments about those statements or block critics altogether. But Judge Barrett wrote that state officials have private lives and their own constitutional rights, The case has forced the court to deal with the competing free speech rights of public officials and their constituents in a rapidly evolving virtual world. A new report has found an unprecedented surge in dark money groups and spending this election year. The report suggests that the record pace as of right now, it could surpass the record $660 million spent by unknown sources four years ago in 2020. Farah Siddiqui reports. Political spending by donors who stay hidden is reaching record highs, according to a report by Open Secrets. Author Anna Masulia says dark money might be coming from shadowy shell companies or nonprofits and funds misleading attack ads against candidates from either party. When you have dark money groups fueling the spending, the voter may not know what interest the secret donors behind that have in getting a specific candidate elected, a ballot measure passed, or any other policy issue. I'm Farah Siddiqui for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. As we get closer to the 2024 U.S. presidential vote, experts are discussing the dangers posed by artificial intelligence and disinformation during elections. In Utah, 
Legislation could mandate disclaimers whenever artificial intelligence is used in political ads. The bill's sponsors hope it will lead to increased voter awareness. Alex Gonzalez has that story. Shauna Broussard is a commissioner with the Federal Election Commission and contends disclosure efforts are an effective way to inform voters but not infringe on First Amendment rights. There's a big controversy that deals with First Amendment rights when you're dealing with speech and particularly when dealing with political speech. But one thing that the courts have said that when it comes to disclosure, disclaimers are still okay. Broussard says while a number of states have passed AI-related legislation, it should be regulated at the federal level. Digital watermarking and other alternatives have also been suggested, which Broussard says is a step in the right direction, but not sufficient to solve the problems AI is causing. Daryl West is a senior fellow with the Brookings Institution. He says while AI has presented unique and new challenges and does support legislation, he argues holding bad actors accountable with existing laws could be part of the solution. We need to enforce them. We need to start prosecuting Uh, the worst offenders. The Brookings Institution has also published a list of best practices for state election officials to follow, which include facilitating dialogue with voters and the public around potential challenges of AI, training election staff to use AI tools appropriately, as well as testing for and mitigating potential AI dangers before launching AI tools and services. And I'm Alex Gonzalez. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. President Joe Biden today praised a speech by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer in which the New York Democrat called for Israel to hold elections to replace Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Biden told reporters that Schumer contacted senior White House staff in advance to tell them he planned to deliver yesterday's speech, in which Schumer from the Senate floor blasted Netanyahu as an obstacle to peace in the Middle East, saying he's lost his way by putting his own political survival ahead of the best interests of Israel. Sakar Magani reports from Washington. President Biden is backing the Senate's top Democrat after Chuck Schumer called for new elections in Israel. Schumer yesterday blistered Israel's leader. Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way. Saying Israel has lost global support as Palestinian casualties grow during its offensive in Gaza. He made a good speech and I think he uh, expressed a serious concern shared not only by him, but by many Americans. The president's backing is the latest sign the U.S. relationship with Israel is heading toward a fracture amid the Gaza war. The latest challenge is Israel's plan to go after Hamas in Rafah, where Palestinians have clustered to avoid fighting elsewhere. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and the U.S. insist Israel must have a clear plan to minimize civilian harm. And we've not yet seen such a plan. Sagar Magani, Washington. President Biden today hosted Irish Prime Minister Leo Varadkar at the White House. The visit of Irish leaders to Washington around St. Patrick's Day has become somewhat of a tradition. But the issue of the war in Gaza came up during questions from reporters. Varadkar says he and other EU leaders would like to see a humanitarian pause in the fighting to allow aid into Gaza and hostages held there by Hamas out. I'm not uh, obsessed about what language we use. Uh, What we want is the killing and the violence to stop, uh, to stop so that humanitarian aid can get into into Gaza, where Palestinian people are, innocent Palestinian people are suffering, uh, and also um, to allow us to get EU citizens out. The U.S., Egypt, and Qatar have been working on a temporary humanitarian ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas. The United States, meanwhile, is circulating the final draft of a United Nations Security Council resolution to support international efforts to establish an immediate and sustained ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. It is part of a potential deal to release hostages taken captive during Hamas's attack on southern Israel on October 7th. No time has been 
set for a vote in the Security Council on the U.S. resolution, and the text could still be changed. The draft apparently omits opposition to a ground invasion by Israeli forces into the southern Gaza city of Rafa. Charles de Ledesma reports. The U.S. has circulated the final draft of a U.N. Security Council resolution that would support international efforts to establish an immediate and sustained ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. It's part of a potential deal to release hostages taken captive during Hamas's surprise attack on southern Israel on October 7. No time has been set for a vote and the text could still be changed. The final draft does not include the tough language in the initial text, saying Israel's planned major ground offensive in southern Rafa should not proceed under current circumstances. I'm Charles de Ledesma. Australia is joining the European Union, Canada and Sweden in restoring funding to the United Nations Aid Agency in Palestine, UNRWA, after cutting funds when Israel accused 12 UNRWA staff of involvement in Hamas's October 7th attack on southern Israel. UNRWA says its staff was tortured into giving false confessions in the matter, including undergoing beatings and waterboardings. Australia's foreign minister, Penny Wong. The best available current advice from agencies and the Australian government lawyers is that UNRWA is not a terrorist organisation and that existing and additional safeguards sufficiently protect Australian taxpayer funding. Australia has been working with a group of donor countries and with UNRWA on the shared objective of ensuring the integrity of UNRWA's operations, rebuilding confidence and, so importantly, ensuring aid flows to Gazans in desperate need. A group of congressional Democrats is also calling for restoration of U.S. funding for UNRWA. The Israeli military said today that a ship has delivered 200 tons of food, water, and humanitarian supplies to Gaza, inaugurating a sea route from Cyprus. The sea route is intended to bring more assistance to alleviate the humanitarian crisis in the enclave five months into the war between Israel and Hamas. The food on the ship was sent by World Central Kitchen, the charity founded by celebrity chef Jose Andres and was transported by the Spanish aid group Open Arms. The ship left Cyprus on Tuesday. Gaza's health ministry said today that 149 people were killed over the past 24 hours in fighting, bringing to at least 31,490, the number of Palestinians killed so far in the war. Evangelical Christians from the United States and other nations have been coming to Israel to volunteer to help in its war effort. Evangelicals have been among Israel's fiercest foreign supporters for years, particularly in the United States, where their significant political influence has helped shape the Israel policy of recent Republican administrations. They believe Israel is key to an end times prophecy that will bring about the return of the Christian Messiah. Many of these Christians support Israel due to Old Testament writings that Jews are God's chosen people and that Israel is their rightful homeland. Since October 7th, there's been a wave of religious volunteers tourism to Israel, organized trips that include some kind of volunteering connected to the war in Gaza. Israel's tourism ministry estimates around one-third to one-half of the approximately 3,000 daily visitors expected to arrive in the month of March are part of faith-based volunteer trips. In the U.S., support for Israel has become a top priority for evangelical Christians during a presidential election year. They're among the most outspoken backers of Israel's handling of the conflict, and Republicans have faced pressure to cue not just to traditional Republican support for Israel, but to beliefs rooted in the Bible. Charles de Ledesma has more. In a lemon orchard in southern Israel, volunteers provide extra hands for farmers struggling to harvest crops. Swiss volunteer Anne-Marie Freen says her evangelical faith has a home in Israel. 
It's an honor to serve this land and to be near you, to cry with you, to pray with you, to hope with you, to believe with you. Since the Israel-Hamas war began five months ago, evangelicals have been visiting Israel in growing numbers to volunteer and support the war effort. A volunteer from the Netherlands, Ganny van Veen, thinks the world's against Israel, but her church is certainly not. I know the whole world hates Israel. And I want to say, and we want to say as a group, we love Israel and we stand behind you. Tourism to Israel has plummeted since October when the war started. Now half of those who do visit come with faith-based groups, authorities say. In the US, support for Israel has become a top priority for evangelical Christians during a presidential election year. I'm Charles de la Desma. According to Ukrainian officials, two Russian airstrikes in the Ukrainian city of Odessa killed 14 people. The first strike hit homes. The second strike, coming just a few minutes later, hit first responders. A paramedic and an emergency service worker among the dead. Some 46 others were wounded. At least 10 houses and some emergency service equipment damaged in the attack. The regional governor announced that a day of mourning in Odessa will be held tomorrow. It's a second such observance in less than two weeks. On March 2nd, a Russian drone struck a multi-story building, killing 12 people, including five children. Germany, France, and Poland vowed today to procure more weapons for Ukraine and step up production of military equipment along with partners in Ukraine, promising that Ukraine can rely on the trio of European powers as it tries to overcome a shortage of military resources. Charles de la Desma reports. The leaders of Germany, France and Poland are meeting in Berlin to discuss support for Ukraine. They want to send a signal of unity and solidarity as Kiev grapples with a shortage of military resources and Russia votes in an election all but certain to extend President Vladimir Putin's reign. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is welcoming French President Emmanuel Macron and Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk for a summit of the so-called Weimar Triangle of the three major European powers, a format that they're trying to revitalise after relations were strained under Poland's previous nationalist government. I'm Charles Villadesma. United Nations-backed human rights experts say they've gathered new evidence that Russian jailers have tortured Ukrainian prisoners of war calling the acts war crimes. Eric Mosa is chair of the Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine. The new evidence strengthens the Commission's previous findings that torture used by Russian authorities in Ukraine and in the Russian Federation has been widespread and systematic. Victims' accounts disclose, disclose relentless, brutal treatment inflicting severe pain and suffering during prolonged detention, with blatant disregard for human dignity. This has led to long-lasting physical and mental trauma. The Commission said in a report today that human rights violations have been widespread since Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered his troops to invade the country more than two years ago, and that civilian suffering from the war continues to mount. It said Russian forces regularly showed little regard for possible harm to civilians in their military operations and cited incidents of rape and sexual violence against women. The world's largest economies warned Iran today not to send ballistic missiles to Russia for its war on Ukraine or face new sanctions. The Biden administration has been warning for months that Iran is planning to send Russia close-range ballistic missiles so Moscow can replenish its dwindling stockpile. The U.S. has yet to confirm missiles have moved from Iran to Russia, but U.S. and European officials are alarmed by public comments from Iranian officials suggesting a deal is imminent. Sagar Magani reports. 
The Biden administration has been warning of the possibility for months. The United States is concerned that Russian negotiations to acquire close-range ballistic missiles from Iran are actively advancing. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said in January if a deal went through, the response would be severe. Today, with U.S. officials worried a deal is imminent, the U.S. and G7 allies say they will pile new sanctions on Tehran if it moves forward. Major Western economies already impose extensive sanctions on Iran. Sagar Magani, Washington. Presidential elections got underway in wartime Russia, including the four Ukrainian regions it annexed since its war in Ukraine began. Vladimir Putin's expected to win, making him the longest-lasting leader of Russia since the rule of Joseph Stalin. This comes as Ukraine says two border regions, Kursk and Belgorod, are active combat zones. Ukraine is backed by anti-Kremlin forces in the fighting. Daria Chernyshova reports from Moscow. Even though it is the shortest ballot in the history of modern Russia with only four candidates listed, this year the Russian people are able to cast their ballot online. They have this option for the first time in the presidential election. They are also coming to the polls for three days in just, instead of just one. That's yet another novelty. So the authorities are doing everything possible to ensure that the turnout in this year's presidential election is high. What Russians have been saying for now is that the vast majority are going to vote for the continuity, both domestically and internationally, as they do see no other viable alternative to the incumbent President Vladimir Putin at the moment. Daria Chernyshova reporting from Moscow. More from reporter Charles de la Desma. Russia's begun three days of voting in a presidential election that's all but certain to extend President Vladimir Putin's rule for six more years after he stifled dissent. At least half a dozen cases of vandalism at polling stations have been reported, including a firebombing and several people pouring green liquid into ballot boxes. An apparent nod to the late opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who in 2017 was attacked by an assailant splashing green disinfectant in his face. The election takes place against the backdrop of a ruthless crackdown that's crippled independent media and prominent rights groups and given Putin full control of the political system. I'm Charles de Ledesma. Spain's parliament has taken the first step to granting amnesty to the exiled former president of the Catalan region and hundreds of other political and civic leaders. Spain's conservative and right-wing lawmakers denounced the vote and warned the amnesty would not stand. Aline Alfandari reports. Spain's parliament voted along party lines, 178 to 172, to approve a far-reaching amnesty bill. It applies to hundreds and possibly thousands of politicians and others who helped organize an unauthorized referendum on independence for Catalonia in 2017. The amnesty would also apply to those who took part in protests that included blockades and property destruction after organizers of the referendum were prosecuted. The ruling Socialist Party and its allies said the amnesty law would lead to a new era of coexistence for Spain. Former Catalan President Carles Puigdemont fled to Brussels to avoid prosecution after the 2017 referendum. He currently serves in the European Parliament. Josep Maria Cervera Pinart is a lawmaker with Puigdemont's Together for Catalonia party. Cervera spoke in Catalan during the parliamentary debate on amnesty. His remarks were translated into Spanish. Con esta amnistía quieren pasar página. Cervera said, and with this amnesty, we turn the page on repression and injustice. We're opening a window of opportunity to negotiate the future of a Catalonia for which we want freedom. Spain's socialist prime minister Pedro Sánchez was able to form a coalition government with Catalan parties last fall, only after he agreed to their demands for amnesty. Catalan leaders dropped their previous insistence on holding another referendum vote on independence. Even so, Spain's conservative and right-wing political parties have denounced the amnesty proposal and have promised to slow it down in the courts and in the Spanish Senate. They said Sanchez sold out the Spanish people to maintain himself in power. 
Alberto Núñez Feijó, the leader of the conservative Partido Popular, said the socialists shouldn't underestimate the intelligence of Spaniards. Así que, señores del PSOE, no subestimen la inteligencia de los españoles. Feijó added, it's time to get ready for a new round of confrontation and unilateral actions. He said the amnesty law will not lead to reconciliation, but to submission. Esto es sumisión. This week's vote is the first step in passing the amnesty law. It now heads to the Spanish Senate, which can delay but not block passage. Within two months, the law will return to the Congress of Deputies for a final vote. Socialist lawmaker Patsy Lopez Alvarez said the law will close the cycle of political division in Catalonia. Solo la política podía ya resolver. Lopez said only political action can resolve the political problem of Catalonia. He said conservatives don't understand it's necessary to offer alternatives and political dialogue to try to understand those with political differences, to calm political conflicts, and to offer hope for reconciliation. Meantime, exiled former Catalan President Carlos Puigdemont said he will probably decide next week whether to run in upcoming Catalan elections while abroad. If he's cleared by the amnesty, then in theory he would be free to return to Spain later this year. I'm Eileen Alfandari for KPFA News. As many as 60 people are feared to have drowned on a vessel carrying migrants across the Mediterranean Sea from Libya to either Italy or Malta. The operators of a charity rescue group said it had rescued 25 people in very weak condition in coordination with the Italian Coast Guard and that two unconscious people were flown to Sicily by helicopter. The central Mediterranean is one of the world's deadliest migration routes. Reporter Ishan Garg in Brussels has more. The migrants on the boat that sailed from Libya are believed to have been headed for Italy or Malta in Europe. The rescue team that finally found the boat adrift at sea says it managed to save 25 people. But not before many on the boat perished, likely due to a lack of basic supplies. Those on the rubber dinghy included at least one child and several women. SOS Mediterrane, the charity that carried out the rescue op, says it believes that the engine on the boat broke down three days after it left Libya and the migrants were stranded at sea without food or water. Many of those saved are being treated with supplemental oxygen as their condition remains serious. Ishan Garg, New Delhi. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. Online at kpfa.org. It is an hour-long newscast each weeknight at 6 o'clock. On the weekends, there's a half-hour edition also at 6 o'clock. All of our newscasts are archived online at kpfa.org. And they're also available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. In Oklahoma, hundreds marched and rallied at the state capitol yesterday to protest the death of the death of non-binary indigenous teenager Nex Benedict, whose death was ruled a suicide this week. Benedict was bullied for a year at their high school, and LGBTQ rights advocates say the state's anti-trans laws contributed to the hostility towards Benedict. The new minimum wage. Trans lives matter. Trans lives matter. You staged a high school walkout chanting "Trans Lives Matter." This teen spoke on the Capitol steps. We deserve the right to be children in peace at school. President Joe Biden released a statement in memory of Nex, saying we must address the suicide crisis impacting too many non-binary and transgender children, saying no one should face the bullying that Nex did. A bipartisan group of Oklahoma lawmakers released a joint statement in which they said Benedict's death was a harsh reminder of the power that words have. The governor and the state attorney general both released statements condemning bullying. The Republican-led Tennessee House has advanced a proposal that would require law enforcement agencies in the state to communicate with federal immigration authorities if they discover people are in the country without authorization 
and would broadly mandate cooperation in the process of identifying, catching, detaining, and deporting them. The House vote coincides with efforts in other Republican-led states to inject more state and local involvement in immigration enforcement while criticizing President Biden's border policies. That includes a Texas law allowing authorities in that state to arrest migrants who enter the U.S. illegally and to order them to leave the country, which remains blocked temporarily in court. Lisa Dwyer reports. The legislation would broadly mandate cooperation in the process of identifying, catching, detaining, and deporting immigrants deemed to be here illegally. Critics say it will create confusion because federal law says it is voluntary for states and local governments to get involved. The vote coincides with efforts in other Republican-led states to inject more state and local involvement in immigration enforcement. Action on the Tennessee bill now moves to the GOP-led Senate floor. I'm Lisa Dwyer. President Biden has come out against the sale of U.S. steel to a Japanese firm. Biden opposes the planned sale of U.S. steel to Nippon Steel of Japan, saying the United States needs strong American steel companies powered by American steel workers. Donna Warder has the story. President Joe Biden says he opposes a planned sale of U.S. steel to Nippon Steel of Japan. The president saying that it's vital that U.S. Steel remain an American steel company that's domestically owned and operated. Biden says in a statement that he does not support the purchase of U.S. Steel by Nippon Steel of Japan and that U.S. Steel has been an iconic American steel company for more than a century. Biden has made the restoration of American manufacturing a cornerstone of his agenda as he seeks another term in the White House, and he has the endorsement of the AFL-CIO and several other prominent unions. Nippon Steel announced in December that it wanted to buy U.S. Steel for $14.1 billion in cash. Donna Water, Washington. California's newly formed Fast Food Council met today for the first time to hear issues of concern to fast food workers. The meeting took place as state labor officials were announcing that Panera Bread and other restaurants that also bake bread are not exempt from the state's $20 an hour fast food minimum wage law. Max Springle reports. The new minimum wage law had exempted restaurants that also bake bread on site, which would have included Panera Bread because it bakes pre-prepared dough at its restaurants. Critics called it a carve-out for Greg Flynn, a campaign contributor to Governor Newsom, who owns 24 Panera Bread locations statewide. Flynn had said that he would pay his employees the new minimum wage anyway. Meanwhile, the state's new Fast Food Council met today for the first time in Oakland. The council is made up of franchisees, restaurant chain representatives, and labor representatives. The council will weigh in on things like industry pay, hours, and working conditions. Anisha Williams is a jack-in-the-box worker and member of the Fast Food Council. She said there are plenty of issues to work on for the council. Sexual harassment is still going on, wage theft, and just constant just violence on the job. Governor Newsom appointed Williams and fellow fast food worker Angelica Hernandez to the council earlier this month. Williams said the new $20 per hour minimum wage is welcome. But at the same time, bosses are retaliating against workers by taking our hours, um, by hiring new people, shortening our days. And I am going through that right now as a worker. Some Bay Area fast food workers are looking to local government to implement workplace rights and protections that the minimum wage law doesn't address. One such ordinance is the San Jose Fast Food Fair Work Ordinance. Supporters delivered thousands of petition signatures to City Hall Thursday. Gabriela Chavez Lopez is with the Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley. The fast food work ordinance is our beacon of hope, our path to justice. It promises mandatory know your rights training to arm workers against wage theft and harassment. It guarantees paid time off, recognizing workers as parents, caregivers, and individuals with personal needs. California is the first state to create a fast food council. 
It's meant to address the needs of the hundreds of thousands of workers in an industry with little union representation and with a workforce that's made up mainly of women and people of color. The council covers chains with 60 or more locations nationally. The council will meet twice a year to hear testimony from workers and employers and make recommendations to state labor agencies to consider as possible new workplace regulations. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. A federal judge today appointed a special master to oversee the troubled federal women's prison in Dublin, known for rampant sexual abuse against inmates, marking the first time the Federal Bureau of Prisons has been subject to such oversight. The judge's scathing order encompasses the Federal Correctional Institution in Dublin in the East Bay, located about 20 miles east of Oakland. A 2021 Associated Press investigation found a culture of abuse and cover-ups at the prison, and it brought about increased scrutiny from Congress and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The order is part of a federal lawsuit filed back in August by eight inmates and the advocacy group California Coalition for Women Prisoners. They allege that sexual abuse and exploitation has not stopped, despite the prosecution of the former warden and several former officers in the complex. A former Mississippi police officer has pled guilty to a federal civil rights charge after authorities say he forced a man to lick his own urine off the floor of a jail cell in the city of Pearl, Mississippi. Lisa Dwyer reports. Michael Christian Green pleaded guilty to a charge of deprivation of civil rights after Green arrested the man on December 23rd. At the time, Green was still a Pearl Police Department patrol officer. Although court documents did not mention race, Green is white and a city spokesperson said the man Green arrested is Latino. Charging documents say that the man knocked on the holding cell door and tried to tell Green that he needed to urinate. After waiting for some time, the man went to the back of the cell and urinated in a corner. Security footage shows Green threatening to beat up the man before forcing him to lick up the urine. Green faces up to one year in prison and a $10,000 fine. He was also ordered to surrender his Mississippi law enforcement certification. I'm Lisa Dwyer. Organizers of a campaign to recall Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price said today that they welcomed a manual count of signatures gathered to get the recall on the ballot after the county registrar of voters announced that a random sampling of the signatures did not meet its criteria. The county registrar of voters announced today that the results of a random sampling of the 123,374 signatures submitted in a petition on March 4th by the group Save Alameda for Everyone are not sufficient to determine whether the signature threshold to call for a recall election has been met. The recall effort needs 73,195 signatures to qualify for the ballot. State law mandates that the county registrar conduct a manual count when a random sampling does not produce a statistically confident determination of the sufficiency of the petition. The registrar said it was in the best interest of both D.A. Price and the recall proponents to ensure the signatures are counted reliably. The campaign for Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price has asked State Attorney General Rob Bonta to investigate the recall. Pamela Price Protect Win to Campaign alleges fraud and deception on the part of signature gatherers. A letter to the Attorney General's office accuses signature gatherers of using deceptive bait and switch and sleight of hand tactics to obtain signatures for the recall petition by misleading voters what the petition is actually for. Price's campaign notes the recall effort is backed by millionaires who also financed the recall of San Francisco's progressive district attorney, Chesa Boudin. Vermont Independent Senator Bernie Sanders dipped his toe into San Francisco politics this week 
The two-time former presidential candidate endorsed San Francisco's supervisor Dean Preston in Preston's bid to keep his District 5 supervisorial seat. Preston's facing multiple well-funded challengers. In a statement to the San Francisco Chronicle, Sanders called Dean part of a new generation of progressive leaders who are not only prepared to stand up to special interests, but also have the courage to address striking levels of wealth and income inequality at their core. Preston and Sanders, both self-described democratic socialists, and the senator's endorsement comes as the sitting board supervisor faces a litany of criticism from the city's conservatives who have cast him as a symbol of progressivism run amok. The former tenants' rights attorney has even caught the ire of Elon Musk, who called for Preston to be imprisoned and fired from his elected position. Moderates and conservatives in San Francisco are hoping to carry the momentum they gained in the primary election in the city in March into the general election in November. In March, San Francisco voters did approve a slate of propositions strengthening police powers, measures that were opposed by progressives in what observers called a sharp turn to the right for the mostly liberal city. Tim Redmond, founder of the online newspaper 48 Hills, talked to KPFA's Brian Edwards Teekert about that characterization of San Francisco's election results. It was a fairly low turnout election for a primary, in part because there was nothing contested at the top of the ballot. This is not you know, Bernie Sanders running for president. This is not a contested state assembly or state Senate race. Um, it was all local stuff and no major offices on the ballot. And what we saw was um, much higher turnout among conservative voters than among progressive voters. The progressive areas of the city just had very, very low turnout. And the conservative areas uh, voted in much larger numbers. It's partially because I say what one of the things that we see is that progressive turnout is in part driven by something at the top of the ballot that brings voters to the polls. So I think we will see a different electorate in November. Part of it, I think, is a lot of people not wanting to show up to vote for Joe Biden. Uh, I mean, not only because he's obviously going to win California, but because they're unhappy with Joe Biden. Um, you mix that in and then you add in millions of dollars in spending by a handful of billionaires who were pushing a very, very right-wing agenda, particularly on law enforcement. And you you got, as in, generally speaking, a fairly conservative outcome. I'm not sure, I think it's a little premature to say that San Francisco was moving to the right. I think it is safe to say that the um, progressive voters in San Francisco did not show up at the polls in the kinds of numbers that it would take to counter that. Well, you, you understand the precinct turnout maps in San Francisco uh, much better than I do. What What's the evidence that the problem was lefties staying home versus uh, people susceptible to tough on crime politics being drawn out by the initiatives that the mayor and her allies put on the ballot and dumped a lot of advertising money into? It was both. I mean, when you look at the precinct maps, you see that in the, the on the west side of town, in the more conservative precincts, the turnout was early and very, very strong. And that's why, of course, after the first day, the next day, the Chronicle announced that San Francisco is no longer a progressive city. But that was with, you know, a very, with, with, you know, fewer than 20 percent of the votes counted. And, it, and all of that, almost all of that coming from the more conservative areas in town. Um, interestingly, the part of the right wing attack on San Francisco particularly around law enforcement and crime issues, was an attempt to get rid of two judges, Patrick Thompson and Michael Beggert, and that failed. Both of the judges kept their jobs, uh, which is a kind of interesting response. But on the ballot initiatives, there was just so much money poured into these and so much misleading information that, it, you know, and, and I, I will say, th this idea of drug screening for welfare recipients 
everyone with any sense knows it's never going to happen. Right? First of all, the um, Service Employees International Union has filed a unfair practices grievance about it because these are the folks who are going to have to do it, and there's nowhere near enough of them. There are no, there is nowhere near enough social workers in San Francisco to handle drug screening for five thousand people. It's never going to happen. Right? If it does happen, all it's going to do is lead to more homelessness, and yet. This was very, very popular. The mayor put this on the ballot to drive out the conservative vote because what she really wanted and her allies wanted was to take control of the local Democratic Party, which they did. And they wanted to take control of the local Democratic Party, the Democratic County Central Committee, because in November, when we will vote for a mayor, um, there will be, the idea is there'll be much higher turnout and there'll be a lot of people who turn out who only vote in presidential years who are not as plugged into local politics. And the theory is that the endorsement of the Democratic Party will be very powerful for those voters. And that will help now, obviously, London Breed, whose allies did take over the Democratic Party. So it, it's not the first time that the right wing of city politics has had its hands on the, the machinery of the Democratic County Central Committee. Um, that, not, not at all. No. What kind of fallout did that have in the past? Well, the, 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 the only real issue is the endorsement of the Democratic Party and how important and powerful that is. I think it's probably, it's going to be important in November. It's probably less important than it was 10 years ago because I think there's more and more people who identify as declined to state or who don't take the Democratic Party's endorsement as seriously. But it's still a significant, it will be a significant factor. It will make it more difficult for people who are running against London Breed. Um, how difficult, what big a difference, it's it's really hard to say because we have not had, let's remember, for decades now, the mayor of San Francisco was elected in an off year. This is the first time that the mayor of San Francisco will be elected in the same year as a presidential campaign. And the city moved this, the voters moved this, in part because we want to see higher turnout in a mayor's race. Nobody really knows how that what, what the impact is really going to be. But I will say that um, it is almost certain that the turnout, that the electorate that we will see in November will be a lot more progressive than the electorate that we saw this time around. Tim Redman is founder and editor-in-chief of the online news service 48 Hills. The latest vote count in San Santa Clara County shows that after steadily picking up votes in the week and a half since Election Day, State Assemblymember Evan Lowe is now leading Santa Clara County Supervisor Joe Samidian by 59 votes in the highly watched race for the seat in Congress of retiring Anna Eshoo. Lowe has been picking up more votes than Samidian in the count of mail-in ballots. Both Samidian and Lowe trail former San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo, who holds a commanding lead with some 21 percent of the votes in the 16th Congressional District. The top two finishers will face off in November. And the office of Governor Gavin Newsom has announced that the governor is postponing his State of the State address, originally scheduled for this coming Monday. Speculation is that Newsom has postponed his speech until he learns the outcome of Proposition 1, the state proposition that is still too close to call. It was heavily promoted by Governor Newsom, the measure to deal with mental health care and homelessness. Water experts and environmentalists are calling on state water regulators to impose stronger urban water conservation regulations to help the state prepare for a warmer, drier future. Earlier this week, the California State Water Board released updates to its proposed urban water conservation rules. According to water experts and environmental justice advocates, the updated draft regulation still allows for increases in water use in the near term, which they say delays necessary urban water conservation until the year 2040. During a press hearing over Zoom, Tracy Quinn, president and CEO of Los Angeles-based Heal the Bay, said that one of the biggest problems with the updated regulation is that it puts off much-needed conservation efforts for far too long. The biggest problems I see with the updated regulation are first and foremost that the board pushed back all of the standards five years. 
The result is that essentially no water is required to be saved by most water agencies until at least 2035. So there is no incentive for water suppliers to continue to invest in conservation, at least for the next 10 years. She said that the Sierra Nevada and Rocky Mountain snowpacks are already dwindling and that by 2040, the state will see extended dry periods. She also said that the state water board's decision to prioritize more expensive new sources of water, like wastewater recycling and desalination facilities, will be extremely expensive and will require the use of tons of energy. She said water conservation is much cheaper, requires far less energy, while producing far fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Jennifer Clary is the state director for the environmental group Clean Water Action. She said water efficiency is cheaper and has been underused in low-income communities, which will face higher water bills as a result. Delayed compliance in these regulations is not helpful for small communities. In fact, it means that they're going to be paying higher bills for longer, that they're not, that their relief is going to be postponed. So a progressive plan would be to front these, to make the investments in low-income communities sooner rather than later. According to a Pacific Institute study, the state's current water conservation plan is projected to reduce water use by only 12 percent by 2040. Governor Newsom's 2022 water supply strategy set a goal of at least a half million acre feet of water conservation by the year 2030. The water savings for the revised regulations are projected to be only 181,000 acre feet in 2030. Heather Cooley is the director of research with the Pacific Institute. She said these revised regulations are doing little to mitigate the effects of climate change. Recent experience shows that early action is the best action um, to prepare our communities for climate change, and the revisions put our communities and ecosystems at greater risk for years to come. On March 20th, the State Water Board will hold a public workshop on the updated proposal and will accept written public comments on the proposal until March 27th. More than 100 groups have signed on to a statement of principles urging the state to prioritize conservation to protect access to safe and affordable water for every California resident. An execution scheduled for next week would be the first in the state of Georgia in more than four years. States trying to move beyond an agreement made amid the coronavirus pandemic that effectively halted lethal injections there. Haya Panjawani reports. The state of Georgia will resume executions next week after a four-year pause. Georgia halted executions in April 2021 when the state attorney general's office entered an agreement with attorneys who represent people on death row. The break was caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, but court proceedings still continued during this time. So people on death row continue to become eligible for executions as they exhausted their appeals. On March 20th, Willie James Pye, a 59-year-old man, will be put to death in the state's first execution in four years. He was convicted of killing his former girlfriend, and other crimes in 1993. I'm Haya Panjwani. This is the last weekend that KPFA's thank you gifts, or premiums, we sometimes call them, will be available for those of you who missed out on our fundraising drive, which ended one week ago, and we were short some $45,000. We're now short just $33,000, so if you would like to get in on what you missed, the Winter Fun Drive here at KPFA, please go to kpfa.org and see all the KPFA merchandise that is available for your contribution to this radio station. And make a contribution, get some loot Get a gift, get a premium, get a thank you gift from us, and help us cut down on our shortfall, our gap, which stands at $33,000 right now. This is it as far as the um, availability of our thank you gifts. KPFA.org, 
kpfa.org. You've got the weekend left to do it. Sunny with highs in the upper 60s around the San Francisco Bay tomorrow. Slightly warmer inland in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. Sunny with highs in the mid-70s. Carlos Santana. You know, every time I take a solo on my guitar, I'm telling a story. So I learned from my father in in B.B. King and Miles. The reason I mention all of them is because I am them. I I, I identify with their spirit. All of them taught me to tell a story. I am a master storyteller, you know, and and I utilize melody or friends like you, uh, your heart and your pen and journalists to pass the word through the stories. Miracles and blessings are very close to you. Will you come forward and receive them? KPFA, storytelling for social change. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.